Hey, Millie, it's so good to see you after all these years. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to seeing you and everybody else in just about a month in person. I know. Can't believe it, huh? Yeah. By the way, this is Barbara Shore, and I'm interviewing Millie Eidson for our 40th vet school reunion, which is kind of amazing. So, Millie. What did you do right after you graduated from vet school? What happened? Well, I was very fortunate. I got hooked on epidemiology right with our class with John Rife during vet school and um, actually did worked for him some during vet school. And he kind of hooked me up with other epidemiologists in the area. So um, he helped me get an externship during our senior year with the CDC. And so um, up until right up until that point, I was undecided between clinical practice or or uh, epidemiology, but I was able to get accepted to a CDC uh, epi training program called the Epidemic Intelligence Service or EIS right out of vet school. And so um, that's the direction I went and, and stayed in public health my whole career. Wow. Wow. So it was a good choice for you, huh? Yeah, it really fit fit well for me. I had um, studied research and statistics um, in a social psychology graduate program before vet school, and um, and so that's one reason. Once I got into the epi class, that it really hooked me with its population perspective, and and I realized that I wasn't very good at the memorization that's required to be a really good clinician. Oh, so, gosh. So I didn't do very well in the in the clinical parts of, of vet school and, and realized I'd, I'd do better as a as a researcher. So. So uh, I'm going to turn my phone off. Well, so we don't get bothered. But what, I'm just really curious, what was it about epidemiology that's that's attracted you all these years? Um, well, it's it's, you know, addressing questions that that never get fully answered about how, um, you know, one one health type questions of how does the environment and animals and humans all all work together to to uh, either result in disease or health and um, what can we do for prevention and control and uh, a lot of it involves communication to public health communication. And I've always enjoyed writing my entire life. So I, I really enjoyed during the scientific part of my career, um, write, writing up all, all my scientific studies because I always felt like if you discovered something but it wasn't shared, you know, it wasn't really doing anybody any good. So, um, right. so, so those, those aspects and plus um, being in public health, I was also able to teach a lot. So I would ha have, you know, faculty appointments with with neighboring universities, and and therefore help teach new new public health uh, students going out into the workforce. So, so the the variety of of things that I was able to do, um, you know, the the issues that I got to work on were were all very appealing to me. Hmm. I could only imagine that during COVID, it was epidemiology had a boost, you know, and and it's. Uh, recognition and importance, right? Right. I mean, people finally stopped beforehand when you'd say you were an epidemiologist, they thought you were a skin doctor. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but COVID changed that. The, the, the word epidemiology became more familiar to people. But um, yeah, I retired from full-time public health not long before COVID hit. So um, so I wasn't as swept up into to all that um, to all that uh, drama and demands that uh, all of my public health colleagues were, so. Yeah, yeah, that was quite something. And probably will continue to be, you know, I don't know that we're done yet. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I understand that aside from your public health work and your teaching, you've also been an author. Right. So what's that about? 
Well, as I said, I always enjoyed writing. In fact, the summer before veterinary school, my husband was uh, mapping uh, southern Utah for, for the federal government. And uh, and I finally had a summer free. And so I, I would drive up to these high mountain lakes in, at, at, near the national parks in Utah and catch my limit of rainbow trout in the morning. And I'd <laughs> sit there on a picnic bench and hand write uh, a, a romance novel. So that was by, the first novel I wrote. But of course, the minute that we got started in vet school I never had a time to think about any anything else so so I didn't really consider creative writing again until I retired um, from full-time public health and then I was just exploring my creative side in all aspects I was studying foreign languages and painting and fiddle and and photography and all that and um and luckily here in Vermont, um, if you're a senior citizen, you can take college classes for free. And so I took a creative writing class at the University of Vermont, uh, and I, I was required to write a short story for that class. And I had to do it very quickly. And so I thought, well, I better write it about something I know about. And uh, and in my teaching, I had always had a, a fictional plague outbreak, uh, you know, as a teaching exercise. And I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. I'll do a fictional plague, bubonic plague story for my short story class. <laughs> and, and the teacher really liked it. And he said, you know, but this is so complicated. You should really turn it into a novel. And I went, oh, okay. So, so since that time, since that first class, about, uh, I think maybe about four years ago, um, I got the idea to, to write novels about the different diseases we can get from animals and to have them an alphabetic series. So needless to say, plague was put on the back burner. Uh, <laughs> and I started out with anthrax, A for anthrax. So, Oh my gosh, you've got a few books to write, huh? Yeah, yeah, I've got a, a ways to go. I'm right, I've published uh, Anthracis and Borrelia, and I'm in the final editing stages for Corona, and I'm writing the first draft for Dengue. So, oh my God, you are productive. Yeah, four, four, four underway out of 26. So, oh my gosh, out of 26? Well, trying to get alphabetical. So, geez, you know, I have all these books I want to write too, because I've probably, I'm, publishing my second one right now. And I think if I do all these projects, I'm going to have to live a few hundred years to get them all done. <laughs> well, it definitely takes up your time, particularly during during COVID, you know, instead of freaking out, I just, you know, doubled down and just wrote like crazy. So yeah, it was a good time to write, wasn't it? Yes, it was. So, so what about these books? I mean, how can you make an exciting, interesting novel out of a terrible disease. How does that work? It's it's really challenging. Of course, the writing style is very different from the scientific writing that I spent decades doing. And luckily, there's uh, there's a really strong writer's workshop here in Burlington that since the pandemic has been, you know, on Zoom. And I've joined uh, national groups like one called Sisters in Crime. So, um, and, and I've continued every semester to take creative writing classes at a couple of the colleges here. So I've just had a crash course at, um, at uh, learning how to be a good creative writer. And it's, it's a challenge to combine the science with, um, with making the story interesting from a fictional yeah. point of view. And luckily all my workshops in which the other authors in the workshops are by and large not scientists, they'll always tell me when, when I'm getting too much into the weeds and the science, you know, when it's too much detail and when I need to explain it for lay people. And, and so it's always a push pull because I'm saying, well, but this is the way public health veterinarians or public health physicians would really talk to each other. But if it's not translating for the public that I need to do something about that. So it's a, it's, it's a real challenge to, uh, to bring in all the scientific aspects that I want people to know about, um, but make the story entertaining with, you know, strong characters, strong realistic characters at the same time, so. Well, that's quite a process. I can only imagine, you know, to create, you probably, you don't have the same characters in every book, so you probably have to create all new characters each time. No, actually, I, I, um, decided to create one through character. So my main pr protagonist is a young public health veterinary named Maya McGuire. And uh -huh. that's what I named my publishing company, Maya McGuire Media. And uh -huh. it's inspired by our daughter. My husband and I um, in 1995 
um, adopted a, an infant girl from China. And um, so we're, you know, multiracial, multicultural family. And so um, I wanted to have a character, you know, like her, you know, in honor of her experience. And so that's the character Maya McGuire, who was adopted from, from China. And um, then, of course, the public health stuff is, is from me. And um, so she continues throughout the whole novel. She, she will be the through thread. But, um, and there are characters that are, you know, other characters that are introduced in the first novel, Anthracis, that carry forward. You know, some will carry forward into the subsequent novels and some won't because she, she starts out in this EIS training program that I did um, when she's, uh, let's see, when she starts out, she's 25, I think, 25, 26 years old. And, um, and so we're going to follow her through. I'm planning by the end of the Zika book to have her probably <laughs> in her early 40s. So uh, so she's going to travel worldwide and have lots of things happen to her. And so. Wow. So you probably have, if she's traveling to all these countries, you probably have to research the countries and know what the culture is and all that kind of stuff, huh? Yeah, I, I prefer to write from my own personal knowledge. So luckily throughout my life, I've been able to do a lot of travel. You know, we've we've been to China uh, several times and uh, other countries worldwide. So whenever I can, I try to set my scenes in places where I've actually been because I, I just feel like that gives more realism to them. But but. Uh, of course, I augment that with a lot of research. So, wow, amazing! So, I, I have about a billion questions rolling around in my head. Um, I'm kind of curious about your family. You said your husband travels. What, what was he? Geologist, or what? What was yeah, he, he doing? He was a cartographer, map maker. Um, first for oh. the. U Geological survey and then for various uh, state agencies. And so um, he had to travel considerably himself. Um, I, some, I don't know if anybody will remember, but actually during veterinary school, he was in Antarctica. So for oh, the wow. entire year of, I think it was, let's see, from, from fall of junior year through uh, winter of senior year. So for a full year, he was down at the South Pole. Um, so so I was by myself. Uh, but of course, that was a busy time for us in vet school. So yeah, we didn't have much play time, did we? Right. Yeah. 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 And he actually, when he wasn't in Antarctica, he was working for the USGS in Lakewood, Colorado, and we had a house there. So um, I was constantly driving that highway back and forth between Fort Collins and Denver during vet school. So so that's one thing I feel bad about is, is that I didn't socialize with my fellow classmates as much as I would have liked to because I was, you know, yeah. going back and forth between be, between there. But um, so so I enjoy all the pictures that people have been posting on our uh, <laughs> class website. Yeah, that's great. So um, and your daughter, tell us about your daughter. Yeah, she's 28 years old now. And um and she lives, she has an apartment here in Burlington, Vermont. So we get to see her regularly. And um, and she's very creative. In fact, one thing that got me a little interest in creative writing was I'd, I'd look over the pieces that she was writing for her college classes at Champlain College here and, um, and you know, seeing the books that she had and, and those kind of things. And, and, and I enjoyed her creative writing and it kind of got me thinking, you know, maybe I should take a class. So. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. So she was your inspiration, huh? And what does she, what's she doing now? Um, now she's um, primarily doing, she's into animal stuff. So, so she's primarily a, a cat fanatic, like, uh, like us growing up. And uh, so she does cat sitting, things like that. She, she's, we have a local lake science center here and she's been a volunteer there. So nice. Do you have any cats yourself now? Not now in our, we're in a tiny condo now. So, but, but she has a cat. So I'm a cat grandma. So a cat grandma. Good. That's good. Well, it sounds like you, I mean, you've, you've been married to the same guy and raised your family all these years. Yeah. I was one of the, you remember our class did not have a lot of women and the, of the women, there were only a few of us that were, that were married during veterinary. Yeah. Not, yeah. And 
I was one of them. So, so you know, that- what's interesting to me is that I've talked to a couple now besides you and they've all stayed married all this time that's kind of a I mean it's unusual considering how many people get divorced and how um intense uh this field can be so I think it's a credit to the women who who could do that well and it's yeah. a credit to the spouses too because you know for all of us who were going through veterinary school that was so demanding and it and the, the spouses had to sacrifice and be so supportive of the yes their uh, veterinarians and training. So, yeah, that's right. That's right. Not many men would be able to do that. So that's quite an accomplishment for them too. Yeah, and you know, you said we didn't have a lot of women in our classes. I remember, wasn't it about a third women at that time? That's the statistic I noticed that Jim Fallon put on our website. So, um, so yeah, okay. that, that was certainly a jump up from from previous times, but it still it still didn't feel like like a lot because it was so male dominated. It felt like, you know, and and, and even faculty too. So that's what I mean. The whole atmosphere was male dominated. It seemed right. to me, right. you know. And of course, now there's been rapid change in that. Oh my gosh, it's more than, well, more than half women from what I understand. Right. I remember when we started vet school in 79 and I had worked for a veterinarian before vet school who had graduated like in 1972 or something. He told me that, from CSU, he told me there were only two women in his class and both of them were farm women you know strong farm women there weren't any like us in there so we came quite a ways even even to to where we were to get into vet school you know and I think we we kind of helped set the course for all these other women that are coming in now yeah yeah it's it's exciting to be part of a profession that's seen so many changes you know when I mentioned the externships that I did during our senior year um, when John Reif helped arrange the one at CDC. um, Our externships had to be approved by Jim Voss, and he wasn't sure he wanted to approve it because he said, what does CDC and epidemiology have to do with vet medicine? (laughs) But luckily, luckily John Reif lobbied for me and I was able to go, you know, uh, work for CDC during that that semester break that we had so oh my gosh <laughs> yeah and of course he but, was a well respected you know incredibly knowledge knowledgeable person that, that I honor for everything he contributed to the school but but that was the thinking back then it was much narrower you know more more practice based I think yeah yeah whatever happened to John Rife? I I have not been able to catch up with him so I'm not sure mm-hmm yeah. Boy, yeah, as women back then, I mean, it's only 40 years ago, that things were so different. Because I went into zoo and wildlife medicine, and there weren't a whole lot of women in that field either, and certainly not working with wildlife. It's so different now. But in those days, you know, we were just an anomaly. We weren't, we certainly weren't the usual, you know, Right. Now we've got my favorite show is Dr. Oakley, Yukon Vet. So you got a, a there's so many shows on now yeah. about veterinarians. It's kind of crazy, you know, yeah. and it's so in some ways I haven't watched a lot of those shows, but it's kind of glorified like veterinarians are so cool and they have this idyllic lifestyle and all that stuff. Yeah, they definitely vary in how much they gloss over things. And, and and I like that one because it seems, you know, more realistic and you see the family and all that. But uh, yeah, our own Kevin Fitzgerald was one of, part of one of the very first shows. So yeah, Donna just interviewed him and I watched it. He he was on TV for like 11 years. And that's he was I think they were among the first, if not the first. So that's pretty, pretty good, you know. Yeah, and it's yeah. just again, it's a different way of communication, um, you know, and the more we can communicate and, and show, you know, all the skills that we have, the better. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
The one I really like is All Creatures Great and Small. There's been a new series, and I like the new series. It's sweet. It's just sweet. Yeah. So, Millie, gosh, what? A, so your your primary thing that you're doing now is the book writing. It sounds like. Are you still doing some epide, epidemi, epidemiological work? Um, in regards to teaching, so at the University of Vermont, I teach uh, one semester this semester, spring semester right now, um, and their MPH program is fully online, so um, so it's asynchronous, so I, I'm meeting the students over, over the computer, and I'm teaching about zoonoses and climate change, so um, oh, great. Each semester, they have to do a project, they have to create a slide set and a, and a fact sheet about a particular zoonotic disease and how it's being impacted by climate change. So uh, they're just getting ready to submit their their final projects in the next week or so. So so that's that's good to play a play a role, as I said, in the teaching of new people in public health. So so how how is how are climate change and zoonotic diseases related? I mean, is that really becoming a big thing now? Oh, it's huge, and and of course the pathways are are complex, but uh, so so it's it's affecting them in multiple ways. You have, um, you know, something like Lyme disease, where uh, the uh, global warming allows spread of the tick to new geographic areas, um, and higher altitudes too. So so yeah. that's one risk. Um, with uh, dengue, the book that I'm writing right now. Uh, it's projected uh, to uh, threaten 60% of the population in just a few years, again, because of uh, climate change allowing spread of the, of the mosquitoes, the, uh, particularly the 80s mosquitoes. So, um, so uh, either by spread of the vectors or, uh, or people having to move and you know, have crowded unsanitary conditions, there's um, just a number of ways that that uh, climate change is increasing the risk. So oh, that's really scary. Dengue fever is, is it just in Africa or where? Oh no, no, no. It's, it's worldwide. Uh, again, in the in the warmer warmer climates, but um, in fact, uh, Arizona just announced that they had local spread of dengue. Uh, Florida has has local spread, but um, cases in other parts of the country have been imported cases. But Arizona just had uh, local spread. Um, somebody had gone down in Arizona and had gone down to Mexico, apparently uh, got infected there. And then because there are some 80s mosquitoes in Arizona, apparently one of those mosquitoes bit him when he was back in Arizona and then was able to spread it to somebody else. So they only had, I'm just reviewing the reports right now, they only had, I think, two cases. But, um, but they did detect both positive mosquitoes and people in Arizona um, you know, for, for, and, and evidence of local spread. So. so if this is really happening, and it seems to be that, that these diseases are spreading, what can we do about it? I mean, we can't kill every mosquito and every tick in the world. That's not happening. So what's the solution if there is anything? Yeah, there's a lot of different control measures. Um, there is a new uh, dengue vaccine that's only been approved for about a year. And um, it, it can only be used, it, it's got some side effects and risks. So it's only recommended for places that are that are endemic, which is not the United States right now. But, um, and it's only recommended for a certain age group, and it's only recommended for people who've been infected before. So there's a lot of restrictions on it, but there is a vaccine. There's a, a lot of other mosquito control efforts that, uh, I mean, it's just a huge area of research right now for mosquito control, um, tick control, um, so, so there's a number of things that are that are underway to try to control these dis these diseases. And what about Corona? Yeah, yeah it's a fascinating book. I, I'm I'll be eager to see what people think about it when I publish it, which should should be this summer, um, because of course the, everybody's fighting over whether it was a lab leak or whether it was yes. uh, natural spillover from bats. And um, we may never know the absolute answer to that because, of course, China is not allowing the amount of research there that we would like to do in order to answer that. So, um, 
So I think either either theory is certainly possible. Um, there there are certainly lab errors and lab leaks uh, all the time, um, but but I still think that you know over and over again coronaviruses have been able to leap from bats to other species and then from those species to people. It happened with uh, SARS in two thousand three. Uh, it happened in MERS in 2013, and, and SARS, that original SARS virus that, that came um, to only a little bit to the United States, more to Canada, um, that particular variant of coronavirus disappeared. But the MERS virus, which started a decade ago in, in Saudi Arabia from, can, from camels, is still around in, in, the, in the Middle East. So... Um, so, so we're we're seeing all the time, um, you know, spillover from, uh, particularly the viruses to uh, to humans, and um, and with coronaviruses as well. So, so my bet is that it was the Wuhan uh, wet market that that started it. But, you know, as I said, we may never know for sure. Yeah, for a while they were talking about pangolins that mm -hmm. were being sold in the market, but then I've heard other species and I don't. I yeah, don't there's know. a number of, you know, they're trying to study the intermediate species um, because uh, for instance, like the, the Nipah virus is a, is a relatively recent one in this, in this century, which um, spilled over from bats to pigs in Indonesia. And then people were getting it when the pigs were coughing. So particularly, you know, people working with the, in the pig farms. Um, and so uh, the Hendra virus in Australia, the same thing, spilled over from bats to horses, and then people were getting it in contact with the horses. So there can be a number of species that can serve as intermediate hosts, even though they're not the, the reservoir host. So, and, you, and, and what you're saying, it sounds like, is that the bats are the primary reservoir for all of these viruses? For for a huge number of them, and and people have speculated why that is, and when they've done studies, bats seem to be like the oldest mammalian species that's around uh, on the planet, and so they've had more time to adapt to a number of different viruses and and not necessarily be killed by them, and of course they're ubiquitous, they're worldwide, um, they're small and they fly. Um, and they can have contact with a lot of other species. So there's a number of reasons why they believe that bats are the reservoir species for, for a big number of viruses. So have there been any studies done or being done um, about bats and somehow, I don't know, inoculating them or doing something to the bats to prevent them from spreading all these viruses? Is there anything? There's some studies, but um, it, it's a challenge to do to address any of these diseases by addressing the wildlife. Um, th there have been some successes, like with with uh, rabies uh, in in Mexico, Central and South America. Vampire strain rabies used to be the dominant form, and they developed some really innovative ways. I actually attended a rabies meeting in Mexico where the veterinarians took us out at night and showed us how they would put mist, mist nets up around the fences of the of the cattle. The, the vampires would fly in to feed on the cattle and they'd get captured in these nets. The veterinarians would pry them out and wipe a warfarin paste on their back. Um, and then the, they then they'd let the vampires go. They'd go back to the roofs, and they the bats all you know cuddled together, and and the warfarin paste would get spread around, and it would make them bleed out. So oh it's God, kind of a, that's awful. Yeah, it's a barbaric way to um, to control it, but incredibly effective. And so um, so they've really reduced vampire bat rabies um, in in uh, Central and South America. Which, um, which was an incredible accomplishment because it was so, there were so many human cases, people living uh, in areas where they didn't have good screens, for instance, and at night, the vampires would come in and feed on the toes of the people. And so you'd have all kinds of people dying, you know, horrific rabies deaths. Um, from the, from these vampire bat bites, um, and of course you'd try to educate about getting screens and all that kind of stuff, but it it can be really challenging to to prevent it from that way. So um, this intervention with the with the wildlife 
species did did work for vampire bat rabies so hmm. seems like a very ugly way to yeah, yeah it's it. an extreme it's extreme measure and as i said most of the time interventions are not made at the wildlife area because for instance in plague when i was with the new mexico health department we new mexico is the hot spot for plague in the whole united states and um and we would try to control it by dusting the burrows, the rodent burrows for, to kill the fleas, but yeah. we did not do rodent control programs because, yeah. you know, there were just, there are too many of them and it would be unsuccessful and it would up, upset the ecological balance. And um, it just didn't make sense to, uh, to try to control plague, even though the rodents were the host animals to control it that way instead, you know, just, dusting the burrows for fleas was was an effective way to try to reduce it. Was so, it effective? I mean, did it really yeah. do its yeah. job? Yeah, I, you know, of course, in that local area, and then then again, it would pop up somewhere else. So, you know, it was always kind of a whack-a-mole kind of thing of, of trying to control new new uh, outbreaks of it. But Wow. This is a huge, huge topic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All the, the, it, Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, it can be underplayed, the importance of epidemiology, certainly when we were in school. And yeah, it's huge. And it's, and it's nice as a veterinarian to be able to contribute to it. Um, you know, when we were talking about people having narrow points of view initially and how things are changing, you know, certainly public health has been more physician dominated. And that training program that I got into, John Reif helped me get into it right out of vet school. Um, they would only accept a couple of veterinarians into that program. It was primarily physicians. Oh. And, and interestingly, for the veterinarians, they required that we have master's degrees before we could get accepted into that program. They did not have that requirement for the physicians. So, so we had to, you know, and they and they still have that difference. Um, so, you know, we had to be extra special, uh, extra <laughs> knowledgeable to get accepted into that program. So amazing. Just a, so you had your master's. Right. I had before vet school, I had been in a, a doctoral social psychology program and kind of burnt out on that. Um, you know, the narrow job opportunities and the academic politics and all that. So I I finished my um, master's degree at CU Boulder. And, and oh, I went and, to CU Boulder for my undergrad. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you got a master's in social work? Social psychology. Social, psych social yeah. psychology. Is that, how does that differ from social work? Um, social psychology is research-based. So it's, okay. it's studying okay. social problems, you know, applying statistics to social problems to try to, you know, figure out the causes. So so very similar to epidemiology, just a different endpoint instead of social problems. Yeah. Talking about diseases, but the same statistical methods and everything. So, so you've had a really clear course for your life you know, a clear path. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's zigzagged a bit, but, uh, you know, certainly I didn't, unlike probably many of our classmates, it didn't occur to me to consider veterinary school until, you know, pretty late in life. Um, but um, but I, I'm glad that I did because it's been very rewarding, so. Yeah, I was like that too. It took me a long time to decide to go to veterinary school. When I was a little girl, and we had miniature schnauzers and a pit bull and everything. And we would take them to this vet. And for at least a mile or two before the vet hospital, they would start shaking and crying. They were so scared. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty rough and gruff with them mm -hmm. at the vet hospital, you know. And, and so I never wanted to be a veterinarian until quite a bit later when I realized, oh, it's not always like that. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so, a good, good profession for being able to make it make a difference. It opens a lot of doors. Yeah. But yeah, as you as you found, there there are a number of different ways that we can use our training. So yeah, yeah, I didn't use it directly for the last years, but it certainly has come in handy for sure. Mm -hmm. And the other thing for me personally, with the weird work that I do, is it's given some credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say you're a veterinarian, it's almost always people um, have a little respect for mm -hmm. some reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's good too. Yeah. 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 Wow. So 
So um, is there anything else you want to talk about? You want to talk more about your books or do you, or is there anything you want to say to people before we close? Well, just as I said, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in all the different directions. People have, have taken that wonderful training that we got at, got at CSU and um yeah, I have my website um, on our, our classmate uh, page. So anybody who's curious about what I'm doing with the books, you can find the links there to the to the different ones that I've published, in, including a, a, a book that I just released this winter, of, which is a series of the short stories that I've created for all these different classes I've taken. So those were really fun because you can experiment more in short stories, different characters and different styles of writing and all that. So. Wow, you really are a writer. That's so cool. So um, did you self-publish these books or did you have a publisher? I, I did. Or... You know, initially when I was starting out, of course, I, I thought, you know, the usual thing that you'll find an agent and, and uh, a book publisher and all that. But uh, a number of steps along the journey, I started realizing, you know, I really wanted more control both over the timing yeah. and the content and, and all of that. And so um, so I ended up, you know, creating my own publishing company and publishing myself. And it, it's actually fun to learn about the publishing process and, and, and to have control over it. So, um, so I've, I've never regretted being an independent author. So. Yeah, that's great. And, and, you know, the publishing industry has changed so much over the years too. It used to be that if you were with a good publisher, they would promote your book. They Mm -hmm. would pay for book tours, all that stuff. They don't do anything anymore as far as I understand. Yeah. And it takes a long time to get your book published. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you found as well that probably the hardest part of the whole process is just promotion and marketing, just letting people know what you've got out there. That's, that's really, I find even more challenging than the writing. And um, I agree. um, I agree. And I'm not a big promoter. I've never been good at promoting myself or my work or my books or anything. It's just not my thing. So I know, I know. But we do what we do because we love it. Mm-hmm. And we hope that it'll make a difference for yeah. somebody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a it's a way to communicate with people that you'd never meet otherwise and yeah. Know, hopefully share some insights and so yeah. And I just feel like if if I can create a little seed from mm-hmm. people that will eventually blossom, you mm-hmm. know, just start that process, then that's good for me. Yeah, that's that's how I feel too. Yeah, I don't I don't feel luckily, you know, having worked for government, I've got some pensions and social security and all that, so I don't have to get rich on my writing career. I just I'd like to sell enough to keep the IRS happy, so that it's a you know a small business rather than a hobby. So yeah, I'm not at that break even point yet, but um, but that's my goal is to sell enough just for that to cover the cost of the website and things like that. So. Yeah. Are you working with with a, a publisher? Like a, there are people that will help you get right. through your book. Right. I am. I am. I'm not doing all the publishing by myself. Right. Are you? No, I'm not. I just um, decided just for curiosity and financial reasons and all that, just to do it all myself. I guess I'm a control freak. freak Good so. for you, though. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot to learn. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it it's it's fun. So. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, this has been really fun and very interesting. So um, are your, are, is your husband and daughter going to join you at the, at the, my, uh, my, hus- my husband will be there. Yep. So mm-hmm. great. We get to meet him. Yeah. What's his name? Tom, Tom Henderson. Okay. Yeah. I look forward to it. I look forward to seeing you in person yeah. and giving you a big hug. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you Millie. I'm going to turn the recording off.